Today we're, we're going to spend uh, some time talking about um, imagery, and in particular the Calif so-called California imaginary or the coastal imaginary. So after today we're going to be getting into specific management issues and, and themes and stuff, but, but this is sort of our uh, uh, last bit of framing, how I'd like you guys to sort of you know, philosophically come at um, or, 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 or contextualize some of these things we're going to be talking about throughout the semester. Um, so we're still trying to talk about what the coast is, trying to define what the coast is. Um, and so here's a little intro. Super stoked you are going to be engaging with us in terms of this exploration of our coastal zone, understanding our coastal zone, how can we manage it, how can we make it more sustainable, just all that great stuff. Now, the diverse coastal zone has all kinds of layers and lenses that we bring to this, um, especially in the initial conceptualization of what is the coast? How do we think about the coast? So a lot of people will take natural history as their default um, thing, as, as the framework that they, they first bring to thinking about the coast. Critters, um, coastlines, things like that. That's a fantastic way to think about that. Other people, their first approach is often infrastructure, the built world. So bridges, homes, infrastructure, things like that. That's another um, important lens that we bring to understanding coastal management. Yet other people will have a historical framework that they um, uh, first think of when we think of the coast. What has happened in the past that's brought us to where we are? What are those historic drivers that have led us to where we are here? Yet other people will think about uh, the beauty and the majesty and this, the, the super um, uh, 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 spiritual values, the recreational values, the wonder that's engendered in this really neat, important part of our planet, the, the coastal zone, broadly writ. And then ultimately, ultimately when we're talking about coastal management, we're talking about something that's never solved. It's always being solved. It's always dynamic. It's always changing. There are always trade-offs with every single thing we talk about. Uh, most, most conspicuously, that's the terrestrial world and the aquatic world, how those two things are constantly interacting. Um, but, there, but it takes a whole variety of flavors. And in this exploration of our coast, and in this effort to try to um, make our coast more resilient, better, all that kind of good stuff, we are constantly going to be uh, intermixing these two, figuring out what's the ups, what's the downs, what's the yin, what's the yang. And that's a key part of coastal management. It's a key part of what we'll be doing. One element of the coast is clearly interface, the mixing, the, the edge. Right? So the edge, and the edge can be defined in a bunch of different ways. The edge uh, most conspicuously between the land and the sea, the air and the aquatic, um, but also between uh, cultures, between um, uh, 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 ecosystems, etc. Um, one of the most uh, obvious interfaces is our rocky intertidal, or are our rocky intertidal areas. Um, where we can see clear stratification. So here at this, uh, the intertidal area here, just near Carpinteria, we see this great bench, and we can see just for, um, even, if we did, if, even if there wasn't water in the top of the picture, we could tell there's a gradient, right? There's a gradient. It goes from dry and, and not a bunch of conspicuous stuff on the rocks and boulders to the left, and as we look to the right, um, just a little small linear distance, it's way more abundant. There's way more... Um, in this case, algae and, and invertebrates clinging onto the surface. And this was yesterday. Uh, this is yesterday at uh, uh, the big dune at Thornhill uh, Beach State Park. So what was going on here was high tide. So this was recorded at about a plus 4.7 foot um, high tide, which we haven't talked about tides yet, but that's big. That, that, that's relatively high for our part of the world. And on top of that, because of some storm systems out in the Pacific, we had a huge swell. So in this part of the, this part of the state, it was about six to seven foot consistent swells, and then maybe as high as eight feet. So that's that's possibly on top of that 
um, whatever foot uh, elevation. And so that's why normally on Labor Day weekend, this would be full of cars on the left and right as we look at the screen here. But there were hardly any cars off to the left here. And there weren't that many people on the beach farther forward because the beach was getting pounded, pounded, pounded by waves. And, and this, was, this had blown up rocks onto the roadbed. And so people, everybody, had to drive really slow because there's chunks of stuff in, in the way. Um, and then after I, so I drove past here, checked it out, turned around, came back. And uh, on maybe like, uh, I don't know, two, three miles past here, two fire engines blasted past me. So I don't know where they were going, but almost assuredly it probably had something to do with the high tide. And um, either, either that interface smacking someone or that interface causing a series of events that maybe led to someone being unsafe on the road or whatever. So the interface is a clear part of our mm -hmm. coastal zone. It can be quite dynamic. So this is Indonesia during the tsunami where folks are walking around and all of a sudden this big, huge, giant, um, these you know, waves started to come in. This is Fukushima um, uh, about a decade or so ago. Um, not decades ago, about, about uh, 13 years ago. Um, and this is what we're looking at here is a 30-foot seawall, right? So it's pouring over here. This isn't one little wave. The, in, this whole surface of the ocean has risen up, and that stuff is pouring in. You can see a little bit as for scale some cars and buses and things that are kind of beginning to get um, blasted away. So the coastal zone not only is interface, but can be at times really, really energy intensive mixing of, of ideas and people and, and molecules and things. Also, our coastal zone is because of those things, because of that mixing of the A plus the B and the energy involved and the dynamic, dynamic nature of it, um, is also very productive. So it's the most productive area of our planet as a whole. Um, and so, and productive in, in however you want to phrase it, productive in terms of economic output, productive in terms of the arts, productive in terms of bird eggs, um, what have you. So in this case, this is a, this is a, a, a gull colony, but we also are super productive just underwater or ju just in the, in the aquatic part. So in this case, this is macrocystis, giant kelp, what we all know as kelp, um, and is the fundamental thing about our nearshore ecosystems here in our part of the world, in our temperate part of the world here in California. So um, incredibly productive. And so uh, just to give you a sense of that, um, uh, most plants that we're used to, most trees that we're used to, uh, or, or other plants, they sort of grow from the outside, right? So we lay, so if you think about a tree, right, we have the tree rings because the outer layer is, is laying some <clears throat> tissue down and then a little more and a little more and we get that classic bullseye pattern of a tree ring. With giant kelp, um, the equivalent here, this frond, so, so the equivalent of sort of like a leaf on a terrestrial plant, right? So this frond is the main photosynthetic, main metabolic happening spot on the individual uh, alga. And so this is a stipe, which is kind of like a trunk or a branch. Um, and then on each, off of each stipe come these fronds. So these fronds, they don't, they're not, the tips don't grow like we might think of as like a typical um, tree or, or banana leaf or something like that. Instead, if we, if we go back to the base of this thing, if you imagine this is your, your, your arm, the frond is your arm, the growing part is about where your elbow is. So the, the actively dividing cells, the, ap the, the meristematic cells are right there. So as a consequence, instead of getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it's exactly like a conveyor belt, how this plant grows. So my arm just gets longer and longer and longer and longer, and then the parts that are equivalent to where my fingers are, that sloughs off because it just gets so but And that, that supports a whole entire ecosystem. Because of that, it's relatively easy to monitor, for, for us humans to monitor how fast it grows. So the classic thing is you go and you take a hole punch, literally like you know, an old physical hole punch you, so you knock holes in pieces of paper, and you go to the base of this frond and you punch a little circular hole in there. Uh, usually you do some standard thing, like two centimeters from, from where it attaches to the stipe or whatever, but you pick some distance, right? 
punch a hole right there. Go home, have lunch, have dinner, go to sleep, have breakfast, get up the next morning, come back 24 hours later and measure how far that hole has moved. And under ideal conditions, which are just about now, uh, or maybe probably about a month or so ago, so, so mid end of summer kind of thing, which is, which is where we still have a lot of nutrients in the water in our part of the world, a lot of nutrients in the water, but no storms have come in to really rip things up and knock things off. Each of those fronds will have grown about a foot in 24 hours. And that's each of these guys. And so, I mean, if we just look, glance at this guy, I don't know, I don't know, there's, there's probably, just on, on the part here in the water, there's maybe, just from this photo, there's probably about 100 or so of those fronds. And then it grows up to the surface and hangs out on the surface. So, so another maybe like two, three times that amount on the surface, every single one is growing a foot. So that's why this is one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet um, in terms of fixing carbon, in terms of producing carbon. Um, really, really productive. And that um, only happens in the coastal zone. Then we have the, the, the heterogeneity. So because of, we'll talk about the geometry in a second, but, but the um, patchiness is also really indicative of our coastal zone, right? We don't typically get something like uh, the Great Plains where stuff is, is more or less consistent for, for you know, dozens and dozens or 50 or 100 miles or something like that. We have a much more mixed up and patchy system. Uh, and we can see that in all different kinds of ways. We can see that with satellites and everything else. Um, we can see that just by physically walking through a little bit of the area, right? Where we can see um, uh, different types of for example, plants in one area, and then even just a few feet away, maybe a completely different community. In this case, going from the water towards the uh, upland area. And then there's that geometry. And this is um, not unique, because rivers have this thing as well, but it's, it's fairly unusual on our planet to, to have this. And what I'm talking about is the linear aspect of the coast, the two-dimensional aspect of the coast. So yes, our planet is three-dimensional, the ocean is three-dimensional, our atmosphere is three-dimensional, all that kind of stuff. But, there, but one of the things we'll come to time and time again about coastal management is the fact that there is a coastline, right? We use the term shoreline. Um, and that is quite different. So that, that linear aspect of the coast defines an area where you're right on it and you're either dry or you're wet. And as we'll see, that has all kinds of uh, implications for um, home prices and uh, transportation and all kinds of things um, that, uh, that we use every day. Okay. Because of all these things, because of the heterogeneity and the... And the um, productivity and all this cool stuff, um, our coast has, a, has had a really strong influence on our culture, uh, much more than you would just think um, if we just looked at the, the total extent of the coastlines of the world, for example. Um, and, and we, uh, in fact, it's so common, it's hard for us to even understand that. So, so one of the aspects is it's because we are terrestrial critters and we're on one part of the coastal zone, typically, and we look out into the water, and we, we look out into this area that it's a little more, um, less natural for us to be in, right? Um, there's this notion that it's beyond things. It's beyond the law, for example, as we saw uh, in one of our first lectures, that little clip about um, uh, rum runners off of Florida, right? It's beyond the law. We've, we already mentioned briefly the whole idea of, of um, who owns the land, who owns different areas, and, uh, and how China is attempting to s sediment in, fill in coral reefs to turn them into terrestrial islands to therefore stake a claim and say, ah, oh, this is our jam. Um, and because we don't, um, uh, uh, haven't historically lived in the water, right? We can't breathe in the water and everything. Um, it's also becomes a place not only beyond the law and, and convention, but also a place where sometimes rules don't apply. And so it's where people can go to reinvent themselves and, 
and reconceptualize a new life and things of that nature. So this is Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, who are these famous pirates in the gold, so-called golden age of piracy, who um, were women in a mostly male-dominated um, uh, pillaging uh, industry. Um, and, uh, and they were able to get away with that more easily on a pirate ship because that was a place where it was beyond the, the social conventions. Uh, similarly, um, this is the pirate queen uh, of the 1800s uh, China, um, who had something on the order of 80, th the guesstimates are something like about 80,000 different uh, pirates under her command, and she had something like 1,800 war junks, um, and basically did the same thing that the Caribbean pirates and stuff were doing, but in this case in the South China Sea. Um, uh, again, a place of reinvention and a place where the rules don't necessarily apply. Um, bec also because we're not typically underwater, it's, it's historically been a place of uh, crazy imaginings, right? Since we don't know it's there, sometimes our, our imagination fills in what's going on or what could be there, like this crazy uh, sea monster from uh, several hundred years ago. But also where we continue to um, imagine and, and do that. So here on the left is Leo Carrillo Beach, uh, just near where I shot, uh, just a, a couple miles away from where I showed you that video of the water breaking over the uh, OPCH uh, yesterday. And in this case, they're transforming it into some, I don't know, whatever, some movie or TV set or something, right? They're making a crashed airplane kind of thing, right? Um, and so it's no coincidence, it, it's, it's, it makes sense that Hollywood was here, right? There's, there's other idiosyncratic reasons as to why it was here, but we're so close to the coast, they could, they could invent um, much of the planet by being uh, in proximity to the coast. On the right is um, Shackleton's uh, vessel, which if you guys don't know the story, I should probably share it with you at some point, but um, uh, polar explorer who gets stuck um, and doesn't make it to the South Pole as he tried, but, but survived, in this case, not only survived, but one of the best, I don't, I don't really go to silent movies very often, that's not my typical jam, but when I was in grad school, I went to, the, they just had the restored um, version, the released version of the film. This is from a, what is this from? It's over 120, 130 years ago, I think now. Um, uh, the Shackleton expedition, they took photographers and film, and they recorded their adventure. They got trapped in the ice, and almost everybody died, and they had to do this crazy escape to South Georgia Island. Anyway, long story short, they managed to, a few people had some problems, but, but everybody survived being wrecked in Antarctica over a century ago. Uh, and they saved their tapes. So this is a picture of the endurance, their, their vessel at night. So it looks like a black and white, it's not. It's a photograph that they've, boom, set off a flash. And so you can see the, the vessel with its mass and everything you know, shore up on all this ice. Um, and, their, and their film uh, survived. And so what I, what I went to, that, that silent film, was, was essentially the, the story of their, um, their getting trapped and escaping. It was maybe like a 60 minute film or something, all silent. Everybody was totally quiet and like on the edge of their seat the whole time. It's one of those like derper 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 derper, and then like you know a, a, a text card for like ten seconds, and then derper 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 derper, and then a text card, which might seem like not very YouTubey or it's certainly not TikToky, um, but everybody was completely raptured because it was the real footage and it was a it was amazing. So so that notion of you know this this crazy powerful place, um, it's a world of dreams. Because, it, because things are out of sight, out of mind, it also leads us to problems. Many of our management problems that we will discuss are because we're not witnessing the, the process all the time. And so we can have, for example, ghost nets that are not actively doing any benefit. We're not actively pulling any fish in for people to eat or whatever, but are floating around and killing um, indiscriminately uh, all kinds of marine life. And those are, uh, one of the reasons those are allowed to permit is, or, or to occur is because we, we can't see them easily. Um, there's also the big fear um, of the, you know, as much as uh, people are worried about, you know, evil powers, uh, you know, 
amassing to, to take over our society or steal our money, right? It's even more so when we talk about the, the resources uh, far off uh, in the ocean because we can't even, we're not sure what's going on there. And so there's always this worry that there's some, some, some you know, evil oligarch is gonna take something. And then we have uh, uh, a lot, because of all these things, we have a lot of very powerful interests that come together in the coastal zone. Very powerful interests. And so um, that, that sometimes can appear to do what they want to do, whatever they want to do. So these are some excerpts from Mad Magazine from a few years ago. But, but um, suffice it to say, uh, uh, when uh, President Trump was first uh, in office, hurricane hits um, Puerto Rico, and he flies down and, and basically throws paper towels to the to the um, uh, in one of the photo ops, and as as if uh, tossing a towel is somehow equivalent to to giving help, and so that that became a a, a classic image of of throwing paper towels when somebody's really hurting. Similarly, Chris Christie, who's now running for president uh, again this year, um, when he was governor of New Jersey, he presided over a um, budget crisis, and part of the budget crisis, as unfortunately we have these days. The, gov the, the governing bodies of the state of New Jersey shut down, right? So they, they were at an impasse. And so no, none, of the, none of the state businesses could operate, right? So, or none of the state organizations could operate. And that included, in the case of New Jersey, a lot of the Jersey Shore, a lot of the, the beaches where everybody goes. Or state, most of them are state beaches. So nobody could go to the shore because you couldn't have lifeguards. Nobody could, could make sure people were going to be safe, et cetera, except for the governor. So he took his family out there with his security detail. And so there's all these scenes of, of him and his family sitting at the beach with nobody else around, right? So these are examples of folks that wield disproportionate power and feeling um, you know, that, that I, can, I can do what I want in the coastal zone because uh, I'm, I'm the, the man, as it were. The, the imagery of the coast is ubiquitous. So, we use, even when we're in the middle of you know, Kansas and Switzerland and all that kind of stuff, we use the imagery from the coast because it is so powerful. So in this case, um, this is also from early in the um, uh, uh, previous Trump administration, um, where there was some, I can tell you all kinds of stories about this, but, um, but basically um, there were some very concerted attacks on the Environmental Protection Agency in efforts to dismantle it, remove regulations, et cetera. And so when a political cartoonist was trying to, how do I, how do I articulate that? A flood, right, a coastal flood seemed to be um, a great way to convey whatever the, the political commentary was supposed to be. The coastal rhetoric is completely ingrained. Uh, not, I mean, we're in California, so maybe that makes sense, but it happens everywhere. So for example, this is a, a newspaper from a couple days ago, uh, calm before the possible storm, before that big storm was gonna come in last week, right? And so how do you illustrate calm before a storm? Oh, I don't know, a sunset with a, a pretty sunset with a lifeguard um, station, right? Ubiquitous during the COVID times, when we talked about people can't get out, People want to get out. This was the image. So this, this one is about this new story below from the LA Times is about uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations, right? But the imagery is of people at the beach, right? And so when we talked about restrictions, yes, we could have talked about a park. We could have talked about a movie theater. We could have talked about a library, a baseball, you know, whatever you want to pick. But a, the, a, a, this incredibly large disproportionately large number of the visuals that would go along with this description of social distancing and all these things were at the beach, right? And that wasn't, again, that wasn't just California, it wasn't just Florida, it wasn't just Hawaii, it was, it was how our culture seemed to articulate being close to one another, being far, restrictions, that kind of stuff. And in our, in our language, right? It's also in our language. So a lot of our shorthand comes from coastal and marine language. Um, so for example, we're talking about in this case, DMV, trying to get better at the DMV. It's no day at the beach, right? Because a day at the beach is ideal, apparently. A day at the beach is easy. A day at the beach is fun. And it just goes on and on and on, right? Port in a storm, tide is turning, rough seas, trolling, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. So, so the, the coast and our being at the coast and our 
imagining ourselves at the coast really is um, uh, fundamental to how our culture communicates, whether we live at the coast or not. Uh, and then again, we could just go on here forever, which I won't, but, but uh, suffice it to say, you know, the classic example, the big tide coming to sweep you away politically is, is another uh, classic image. And, you know, pirates and all that kind of stuff. Here's a recent one about uh, President Biden dealing with the recession, image as a big shark, and he's like, I'm good, right? And then here's uh, one about uh, the current war in, in Ukraine, where, um, uh, again, the imagery is being left behind cast away, uh, you know, out in the big open ocean, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's do some analysis of our own. So let's, let's, let's start to work on our muscles that we will be applying throughout the, the semester. So let's start to work on some of our muscles about doing some, in this case, visual analysis. So uh, let's get into groups of, I don't know, three, four, Three, four people, so just scooch up next to your folks. And, um, and uh, so firstly, stare at this. Does this, look like, does this look like it's moving? Yeah, isn't that weird? It's not. It's not. So our eyes can play tricks, right? But uh, I don't know why I put that up. I just thought that was funny. Okay. Um, all right, so number one, uh, when, when it comes to looking at, at some visual rhetoric, Right? And there's a lot of visual rhetoric around coastal management, particularly when people are trying to actively convince us of one thing or another. Let's just sort of, so we're just going to spend a few minutes here and, and work on that muscle. Let's, let's uh, talk about exploring details. Okay, so I'm going to we're gonna look at some different examples of art here, and I want you guys to think about what it means, uh, uh, how you, we can interpret it, what, what you think it means, all that kind of good stuff, and what it implies. So we're going to start with um, this classic... Uh, Renaissance painting um, of St. Sebastian. And there's a lot of different versions of this, but this is the one that we'll use from 1480. And so uh, I'll show you the top detail and the bottom detail, so I'll flip back and forth every once, once in a while. But so I want you guys to tell me what you think is going on here or what insights you can glean from this um, example of visual, uh, of, of, of this cool piece of art. So groups of three or four, Scooch, introduce yourselves, make sure you know everybody who's sitting next to you, introduce yourself, say hi, and, uh, and physically move around, go sit next to him or her, and uh, we'll get going. So there's, there's a chariot, and maybe I can't see it, but there's a chariot here in the clouds, there's a person's face in the clouds, um, so there, there's all kinds of hidden things throughout this, um, throughout this painting. In this case, this was designed as, a, as a, something that you were supposed to stare at and not see it all at once. But, you know, like look at it and look at it and look at it. Maybe after a couple hours or a couple days or a couple months, you'd say, oh, my gosh, there's this thing. Um, uh, clearly, this guy is associated with this side of the, like the sort of the intact and the growing and the, and the functioning, not the sort of decaying, breaking down side. Um, uh, and and I mean, we, can, we can go on and go on, but, but, but you guys get the idea, right? There, there, we can communicate a lot with our rhetoric. And sometimes we just look at something like, oh, that looks cool, or that, that's a well-crafted whatever. Um, uh, there can be lots of subtlety in how we communicate. In this case, well, what this was, I mean, you guys wouldn't know this, and I would not expect you to know this, but so this is basically coming out of one of, the round, one of the rounds of the bubonic plague, the Black Death that was coming through Europe at the time. And the idea was, or one of the ideas, one of the possible interpretations here, is that this saintly man who was pious and, and followed the rules of God and all that good stuff um, was, was okay. Even though he's been pierced by, being, been exposed by, to the, the badness of the world, um, that could be the, the plague and everything else. He's still looking to God, still, still has piety and all that kind of good stuff. So that, 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 that's, that's one example of how we can look at uh, stuff. How about this one? Take a look at this one. This is from 1857 in France. So you guys, so talk amongst yourselves. Tell, tell me what you, what you, what's your overall impression of this and what seems to be going on here. So that's what this uh, image was about. So overall, you guys think... Uh, Positive or negative or neutral with this? Who thinks positive? Who thinks neutral? Who thinks negative? 
Okay, so almost everybody look, looked at this, even though you've never seen this before, don't know who this person is, don't know about his culture, but, but just looking at it, you're like, ah, something looks a little strange, right? From the color, from the composition. Okay, good. Uh, one of the most famous marine uh, pieces of art, this is from a, a wood block, a cart, uh, a you know, wood block um, pr um, print uh, from the early 1800s, um, often called just the Great Wave. Um, this is a, a Japanese artist, so uh, stare at this for a second and get back in your groups and tell me what you, what you guys think is going on here. Other, other impressions? Okay, cool. I like it. Okay, let's look some more at the details here. So this is not a coastal one, but this is probably the most famous one. For ESRM, this is probably, in the U.S., this is probably our most famous image, right? And so you guys have probably spent time in national parks and other classes, history going over this. But, um, but let's take a quick, a quick five minutes and you guys, if, if it's not familiar to you, take a stare at it and, and discuss it and, and uh, maybe come up with three, three ESRM insights each group from this. Um, ready, set, go. Yeah, restoring stuff, yeah, totally. Good, I like it, I like it. How about this one? Ooh, interesting. Like here? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Good. Good, 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 good. I like that. Okay. And then we can talk about uh, uh, some rhetoric. So obviously all, all this stuff has been, all the things you've been looking at have been crafted, right? And, they're, and they're, they want to convey some message. But let's talk more specifically about the message in these next examples here. So here's an example. And we're, we have a couple more to go through, and then we'll take a break, bathroom break. So we have a couple more to go. So... Um, this there's no there's no author for this. This is from a a, a news. This is from a a, a printing um, that was sort of widely circulated in in 1791 uh, about in the wake of the um, uh, Haitian Revolution. So this is this is a, we're looking at Haiti here, or, or the the subject of this is Haiti. So uh, have a glance at this. You guys t see if you can interpret what's going on here or or what the message is. In your groups, and unless we're just we're just getting in groups, so Paul Santos would probably say something like, "Oh, they learned some useful skills or some shit, right?" Um, so, so the message here clearly is that that revolution, that uprising, was a bad thing, right? That that management was that that choice was a bad choice. How about this one? This is from an installation. Uh, uh, before, but then really moved around this, right? That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then let's just talk about the general rhetoric to, to wrap up this section. So here's, a, here's another one. Have a look at this. This is um, uh, from a, uh, a scene of a plantation on Maui. Good. Any other last thoughts on this one? Okay, how about this one? What, what's, what's, what's the... What's, what's the impression given from this? Like, like a sharp turn? Yeah. So yeah. maybe it's, I don't know, it's the people don't know where they're going, where cool. they're going to. Uh, maybe the dream like, yeah, kind of dream like, like what's going on? Yeah. The, the new thing that's attracting us towards it. Good. I like that. That's really good. Anybody else? I think we have one last one here. How about this one? My dad painted that, yeah. So, uh, so this is this is sort of almost the same scene. This is this is a little bit farther inland. I mean, this is a little bit farther south. But uh, have a quick talk about this, and I'll talk about it for a second. But have a quick like thirty second chat. What do you guys think is going on here? Almost like a roller coaster. It's a constellation. Ooh, good. I didn't think about that. That's good. Absolutely. So another imagine another sort of which we'll talk about in a moment, an imaginary, and another, another sort of conceptualization. But this really, so this is where I was uh, born. Um, this is from where I grew up. Um, and, and everything about this speaks to some different level. I mean, it's, it's imagination, it's like whatever, cool. But, but uh, behind it, all of these things that are represented are different examples of management choices. 
So we're out of the ocean and we're looking towards San Francisco at a place called Ocean Beach. And, um, and this is a popular surf spot. Uh, uh, if you're up in San Francisco, a popular place to go swim. Um, but it was also, you know, dangerous. People would drown here a lot um, uh, back in the day because it can be ripped. It's, it's, it's just facing the ocean and, and where the coast is, you get a lot of crazy uh, currents and things. Uh, so uh, big mansions on the hill. This is like where like the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world live, right? So, so that kind of thing is going on. This is the Cliff House. This is where, uh, you know, historically my family had many different uh, get-togethers. My uh, grandpa used to have breakfast in this little place over here called Eagle Cafe every morning. Um, he would swim in the San Francisco Bay, like fucking crazy dude. Uh, swim like, every day with no wetsuit, just kind of like jump in and go, come on, Junior, you know. And, uh, and then he'd come over across the city and have breakfast up here. This was many different iterations. Uh, a, a great example of how things transition in terms of um, management, how things transition. So it, it was a hotel, and it was a bar, and it was all this and that. Uh, very recently, it was, a, it was sort of a nice um, restaurant, not really great food, but you know, kind of like beautiful views. Um, it's owned now by the Park Service. All of this stuff over here is owned by the Park Service as part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And they decided that uh, they're not going to have a restaurant there anymore. So unfortunately, after like 150 years of continuous operation, it's, it's a build, there's a building there, but nobody knows what's going to happen to it. Come over here. This is Golden Gate Park. This is the start of Golden Gate Park. So one of the great urban parks of the world. And this was, um, th so this, this you know, beautiful uh, windmill, they've since been restored. If you go up there now and look, it all looks pretty. And now it's decorative. But they were put in originally as water pumps to suck up water, fresh water, and then use that to irrigate the park. So this is a, this is a management choice about messing with hydrology. This thing right here is what's known as Playland at the Beach. It doesn't exist anymore. We had a similar thing in Venice Beach. Doesn't exist anymore. We had a similar thing in, in Palos Verdes. Doesn't exist anymore. We had something almost kind of like this in Thousand Oaks. Um, that was, that's, all, that's not there anymore. And all up and down our coast, we had these things which were entertainment venues on the, like literally at the water's edge. And so in this case, they had all these roller coasters, and there was a, uh, an ice rink in the wintertime, and a roller rink, and all that kind of stuff. So that, this, this thing is no longer there. Uh, you have all these people hanging out, having bonfires on the beach, which you're no longer allowed to do anymore. Right? Um, uh, and then you have sort of the sea, kind of this siren sea calling mermaid, like, come into the water, come into the water. So, so um, uh, you know, again, just like the last one, it's kind of more of a magical kind of dream-like scape, but, but sort of pulling in different elements of, of, uh, of, of, of the coast. And so uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a, actually, that's it. So, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. Why don't you guys hit the bathroom and come back, and we're going to do an activity. So make sure you have your computers ready when we come back.